Hey, Ryan, good morning. Hello, my friends. I How are you? T -shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love the shirt. Thank you very much, man. You're welcome, buddy. How are you? I'm doing wonderful. Uh, I had to improvise today um, where I normally uh, record. Uh, the space is being occupied by uh, a rescue dog that we uh, are fostering. And so uh, he's excited this morning. And so I thought I would come outside, show you a little bit of East Texas. Uh, we, that, may, we may hear uh, our roosters in the background. Uh, they're waking up. <laughs> the sun's uh, been up for about 45 minutes. So they're still excited and running around. And... Amazing. Well, thank you for being flexible to, to adjust to the UK time here. And appreciate it, mate. No, absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, uh, you know, Ryan, welcome. Welcome to Own Your, the Own Your Space podcast. I really appreciate you being here. And, um, you know, I, I've got uh, your shirt on that you sent me. Um, I love it. It's part of uh, your community. Uh, we are always better than yesterday. Um, uh, I've joined your community on Facebook. And um, it's such an honor to uh, have you today. And so I do, I do want to talk about um, leadership and being a, a heart-centered leader and what that means to you. But before we get into that, I wanted to ask you, Ryan, what is love? Like, what does that mean? Wow. Let's, uh, let's dive into the deep end, shall we? Do you know what? It's, um, it's, a, it's a number of things, but I think the, I think the preconception of the world that is, it, is that love is a feeling. And the, the, the thing I've come to experience over the last three to five years is that love is a verb love is action you know and and i think the more and more that we can connect to what that intrinsically is to ourselves i think it's very unique to each individual pe person I, I i truly believe that we were given a gift a unique gift and our our, our only purpose is to be able to use that gift to serve other people and that's love it's it's about being able to put our own needs to one side and to use our gifts to serve others and that, that's love for me it's about putting myself to one side and looking after the needs of somebody else love you know another word for that is, is, is leadership another word for that is parenting i think it's one of the same you know love meets you where you are and it leaves you a little better yeah that's beautiful um i've always felt that love is the life force the energy that has that allows everything to exist hmm. um yeah i love it that. yeah yeah I, I, i've so in my kind of research in, in my kind of lifelong learning i i come at things from a, a leadership perspective and then i look at my own kind of journey around what did i what did i lack what did i need growing up and and, and it's led me to this sense of love you know i became a leader and a parent at the same time and these two things were the you know the same thing and and then like you just talked about energy my latest sort of reading is is about you know the, the energetic vibrations and when we're in states of love our our bodies are healthier our minds are healthier our communities are healthier and there's absolutely something about love being a state of energy, higher, higher frequency energy. That's for sure. It's definitely a, a vibration um, of higher energy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, you know, you talked about becoming a parent and, uh, and, mm -hmm. and really kind of, you know, owning and, and getting into that leadership uh, role. Um, before that, when did you, when did you discover that you were a leader? Like, were there moments in your life or, or was there a, a mentor or somebody that just kind of, you know, grabbed a hold of Ryan and said, hey, hey, buddy, you know, you're, you know, you, you've got this gift. Yeah. I've been very fortunate to have had experiences that have shaped me in ways that I've just developed a sense of headstrong conviction and independence. You know, I. My, my my father left when I was six months old. Um, I'm separated from father when I was 12. So I, I didn't really grow up with a, a male role model. And 
I, I still haven't figured out whether that's left me with a chip on the shoulder, but it certainly left me with a feeling of something to prove. I don't know whether that's to myself or to, I, I'm not sure. And I'm not sure it really matters because what it really meant is that I was just independent and, and just got on and, and pursued doing great things. Um, fascinated by human beings, fascinated by psychology. First, you know, member of my family to go to university. And I wanted to be a criminal profile. I wanted to know why naughty people did naughty things. And um, I've been with my wife since I was 15. And by the time I finished uni, she was ready to move out, you know. So she's like, you need to get a job. Go get a job. So I, I just got this entry-level job at the police, which was taking 999 calls and dispatching our officers on the radio. Really good, really enjoyed it, but it's shift work. It wasn't sustainable. And, um, yeah, I moved within the police force. I became a, an analyst. Became really good um, and got promoted pretty quickly. And it was at that point that I became responsible for other people. Um, at the same time of becoming a parent and I think the reason those two things are significant is because policing was very hierarchical you know the the image of leadership is one of how long have you been in the job how much do you know and what rank are you and here I was learning both through my leadership journey my parenting journey that you know I had great you know, I used to watch TED Talks and Simon Sinek would talk about leadership in a way that I just wasn't experiencing and I was like he's talking to me talking about purpose and sacrifice and serving i'm like this this is a heart for leadership that i that i want more of it's validating what i believe to be true and it was that you know uh, i don't take advice very well i don't you know I, so i i can't think of that one person over my shoulder that's that's done that other than and i don't mean this in a non-arrogant sense I kind of dragged myself to this point. You know, I, I was very fortunate enough to interview Matthew McConaughey and, and his words where he described his hero as him in 10 years' time. I can't tell you how much those words inspired me as a young man. Because yeah. I, I, I had no one. You know, my mum was incredible. She would work four jobs. She would be incredibly positive, optimistic. But in terms of creating Ryan Hartley, I had to do that myself. Yeah. Yeah, I can, I can relate. And, uh, you know, I, I first uh, heard you as a guest on another podcast talking about uh, leading with love. And I was mm. instantly, instantly drawn to you, um, kind of stalked you a little bit on Instagram and <laughs> Facebook, and then we became connected. And I was yeah. so interested because um, you know, my, my parents, I was fortunate to have both of them together uh, in my life. Uh, and then when I was about 12, they split up and, and it was a huge, it was, I, I think that that was like the most uh, devastating and beautiful. Uh, uh, it was a pivotal point that was both, both yeah. positive and negative because uh, when, you know, when my dad left, I felt like I was abandoned and I had to, mm. I had something to prove. Like I had to mm. prove that I had, I was worthy. And, yeah. and uh, we, we moved uh, across the country and, and started a life over. And I felt like, you know, nobody knows who Jason is at this new space. And so I'm going to be who I want to be. And so I really, mm. I really just started doing and saying the things that before I felt inside, but just mm. I felt like it wasn't the right thing to say and um, just kind of leaned into each moment. And I, and I didn't really connect it with love leadership, more about just caring about people and knowing that if something didn't feel right, that I wasn't going to do that. I was going to do it the way it felt right being in the moment. Uh, and being engaged with people. And, and I, and I hear that from you all the time. And it's just, it's just really beautiful about uh, empathy and being engaged with, uh, you know, navigating it by the moment. And so, you know, it's like this journey of uh, along for the ride, the, the story of a, a, a leadership in the making, you know, or a leader in the making, um, mm. just being yeah. kind of navigated from one point to the next. You know, people always talk in, in in our language. They talk about, oh, follow your heart. Do what you love. Oh, he really cares. You know, he's he's speaking from the heart. It's just simply connecting to those things. I mean, you know, this isn't about 
let's put the blankets down and have great conversations with guitars playing and put some candles on. That's not the type of love leadership I'm talking about. I'm just talking about the sort of stuff that actually really matters to us, that we really care about, really passionate about, that we're willing to sacrifice our time, our energy, our resources. No one wants to do the 3 a.m. night feed. And yet through love, we sacrifice our sleep because we want to nurture and develop this little human being. I just want to create more leaders that feel that way about the people that they serve at work. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, you know, there's, I believe there's two, two types of leadership and uh, uh, self-leadership and servant leadership. And I've heard you talk about them. What does it mean to you for self-leadership? Well, if we follow the model of leadership that I talk about, which is about putting your own needs to one side to serve others, I think the reason we don't get the leaders we deserve is because they signed up for a different model of leadership, which is the rate, the rank, the status, the position. Yeah the car parking space nearest to the building, you know, all the perks and all the benefits. But when the proverbial hits the fan, that's when we really try and when we really see the heart of a leader. And those leaders who didn't sign up for the leadership that I talk about, what happens to them? They throw people under the bus. They self-serve. They, they run a mile, whatever that might be. Yeah. Because they haven't engaged self-leadership which is about having such self-security they know who they are they know what they stand for they've already identified something bigger than themselves that they are willing to sacrifice for and they've given to themselves first knowing that the more that they do that the better they are for those that they serve there's something in the good book that says um the lord is my shepherd and i lack nothing and I think the more that leaders can get to a state where they can show up and not need anything from anyone, they are free to lead from love, not for love. And I haven't always got that right. I was a young man doing great things, but I absolutely loved it when people validated me, made me feel worthy, made me feel, which made me equally vulnerable to when I didn't feel so valued and when I didn't feel so welcome. I was like a lad pursuing love in the world. But what I've had to come to realize is that more than I love myself, the less vulnerable I am to seeking out love external to me. Because when I did that, I, I, I focused and prioritized on the wrong things. I had marital issues three years ago because I, I went to a place where I felt loved. And it meant that I avoided all the difficult conversations I needed to have to repair the areas of my life I should have been prioritizing. Yeah. Yeah, leading with love um, is is beautiful. It's it's not it, it's not the easy path. It's it, there's work involved. I um, it, it, it as you as you embrace it, it becomes natural, and it becomes easy to do. But doing the right thing because it's the best thing for uh, your team. It's the best thing for the outcome. Yeah. And, uh, and just supporting everybody else is, is, is really, yeah. Too, you know. too many people put doing what you love is on a pedestal. Oh, yeah, that's really nice. That's just highly unpractical. Yeah. Well, maybe, but maybe it takes sacrifice and, and commitment and devotion. You know, there's a lot of talk about mindset, you know, the mindset and mindset is a very popular term. And you know, I'm not against mindset hundred percent. You know, that's what I started calling myself when I started becoming a coach mindset coach but people don't realize that the heart must come first because if we engage the mindset and we show up and we do difficult things and we learn and we improve we might go on to achieve great things but if we don't engage the heart first we might end up somewhere like the penguins in madagascar moment where they're like oh well this sucks i've got promoted beyond you know to to i've got promoted to a point where i just no longer like my job and I'm stuck with the salary I have and the mortgage that I've gained and the, the, the cars that I've bought, you know, and, and the lifestyle that I'm trying to sustain all fueled by something that drains the life out of people. And all I'm saying is before we get to those points, put, put your heart first, make it all w worth it. At the end of the day, find something that lights you up, that makes use of the gift that you've been given. Because when we're in those energetic states of love, as I said, that 
<laughs> and here's the science. Perfect love casts out fear. And what science is actually showing is that when we're in states of love and it's a secretion of oxytocin, the love chemical, it inhibits the production of cortisol. And cortisol is the stress chemical, which ultimately, if it's in our body for too long, leads to very unhealthy bodies. Yeah. Um, yeah, I love I love the science reference. Um, science is nature. And I'm constantly, I used to be mindset driven, determined, focused, mm -hmm. uh, you know, achieve, succeed, yep. you know, and, and my, my idea of success was different 20 years ago yeah. you know, on when I started this path and it was always being the best, whatever that means. Mm -hmm. And it has shifted for me and it, it's really, you know, now it's, it's looking around and yeah, I love being in nature and in all the answers, I believe, are in front of us. We just have to pay attention to them. You know, it's yeah the process of science. Uh, and, you know, and we've talked about this in chats where, you know, if you look at the human body and how it evolves, the heart is the first yeah. organ to be in existence because yeah. it feeds life to the rest of your organs. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. And, you know, I, I think I was in a, um, a Japanese restaurant here in England called Wagamama's. And on this menu, it said we've got Kokoro bowls, K-O-R-O-R-O, -O -O, Kokoro. I was like, oh, that's cool. And it said food for the heart, the mind, the soul. And I was like, ah, oh, I like that phrase. So what it really gave me a great image is that we have these three things, a heart and a mind and a soul. And they all serve unique purposes. And there's nothing, I have nothing against the mindset. Absolutely, it's key part of the, the, the toolkit that we have, that we've been given. But we, are, we need to understand when it's supposed to be used and the limitations. Like I said to you a minute ago, if we don't engage the heart first, we can achieve great things, but it might not matter. We might end up in places we just don't, didn't want to be. Yeah. The same way as if we just follow the heart, you know, and, and just pursue the nice feelings, but don't engage the mind, which is all about learning and strategy and being better and seeking feedback. If we don't engage that, then we might not do anything. We might not leave that legacy behind where that, that helps us realize the full potential of our capability. And if we don't engage the soul, but well, the soul screaming out to be still, the soul might be screaming out to be uh, expressed, whatever that might be. You know, and, and, and I just love being able to break down this heart, this mind and this soul, because I don't think it's as ever as simple as just, hey, just do what you love or, hey, let's uh, build your mindset. Yeah. And um, speaking of doing what you love, your community, we are always better than yesterday. Mm. Um, you've been uh, doing that. Uh, what what led you? That was about three, four years ago, right? Is that uh, the community four, is yeah. four years old? What led you up to that, to, to do that? And what's, what's your mission with, with, mm. with the community? So um, through my leadership development journey at the place, I was trained to be a coach. Um, my leadership style was very coaching orientated anyway. I like to nurture, I like to develop, I like to ask questions. Um, so it made sense that I trained as a coach. But at the police, I was only really coaching people who were either a problem or they wanted promotion. And... I just knew that there was so much more potential in people and through coaching. So my wife was a network marketer. She had a downline of about 300 people. And I would just come home and spend my evenings in this office, just coaching her team. It was a win-win. I thought the more I could help her team, the more I would gain experience, the better I would get. I knew I needed to practice to be better. Um, and yeah, and I just spent a year and a half to two years of just coaching for free, 16, 17 hour days. And I built up a list little community of people um, that I'd helped. So I put them all into one place. And um, I was always, I was using this phrase always better than yesterday. My, my own personal coach took me through a process of my own values hierarchy. And this word always better than yesterday, this phrase has never really left me. And because I'm really passionate about um, creating spaces for people to belong, I call it, we are, you know, it's, it's not about me. Yes. It's my heart because I had to create it, but it's now no longer about me because it's about those who do want to seek 
a, a space for like-hearted like-minded people to grow be better to feel safe to feel heard so i created this community um and i love it i absolutely love it. it's been life giving the the friends and the connections that i've made the very fact you and i are having this conversation four years after it just continues to uh, blow my mind yeah i um so i went all in you know I, part of it so that's the love side of that um decision the fear side of the decision behind that community is that I got a lot of scrutiny and judgment at the police when I started to share my heart and mind for leadership. I started to share my learnings on my Instagram page. Here's what Ryan Hartley thinks about what he's learning, and it might help someone. Well, senior leaders in the police would sit around with my social media profile, and they'd say, who is Ryan Hartley, and what does he know about leadership? You know, this young guy, 30-year-old guy, all over social talking about leadership. What does he know? And obviously that triggered me massively. You know, I, 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 the thought of being judged, the thought of no longer being accepted or valued triggered me massively. But I still had this innate desire to express myself. It's a contradiction. I want to fit in and belong, but I want to be myself and unique. And, uh, and I just chose the latter. But, but I went underground. Yeah. my private community enabled me to be who I wanted to be in a private space. It enabled me to do great things, but I spent too long there. So at some point, two years down the line, I had to come out of that community and start expressing myself in public. And that was when I started interviewing people because that was my way of bringing great people on and being alongside them. So I had an opportunity for me to come out of the shadows, but also do it by sharing the win-win of, 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 of interviewing great people. And, and that's now my podcast. And I, you know, published 131 episodes at this point in time. And yeah, it's some of the most life-giving conversations and that help me continue to grow, let alone the people who tune in every week to, to listen. Yeah. I love, uh, I love your podcast. Uh, sometimes I wish that, that the one or two minute episodes were maybe three or four. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I just, I'm like, I want more of Ryan. Um, that I, you funny. know, I totally, uh, relate, um, to, you know, your story with, uh, with being at the police. Um, when I first, I was promoted quickly and it was because I think that I was my authentic self and being engaged with, sure customers um created positive results and and so i was put in positions to uh you know people just said hey do you want are you interested in this next role are you interested in this next role and then i found myself uh, at you know at 25 um running a, a branch in a new state and yeah. and i just it was about being engaged with those people and just being leading with love and compassion and and we would integrate that into, you know, the, the work that we did in, in the outsource service industry in the service business. And, and I always got, I always had positive results and was at the top percentage of my uh, counterparts around the country. And, but I, but I didn't fit in, you know, I would mm -hmm. go to these meetings and everybody would look different and I didn't have the same conversations that other general managers, you know, were having. And so I found myself mm. disengaged, like the, I don't, but when I was in my space, uh, I, you know, I thrived. And so I, I had that, that conflict of, I want to keep being me, but I'm being mm. told that I shouldn't be that way. But yet the results are, po are positive and the, you know, and, and employee retention <laughs> is positive because I didn't have people quitting because people don't quit their job. Yeah. They quit, they quit their leaders, you know? I was, um, yeah, I love that. And, you know, I, I was just before I left, I was interviewed by some leadership review, you know, they were doing a leadership review and they were asking me, what does leadership mean to, and by this point I'd had enough, you know, I was, I was sick of the organization, not valuing me the way that I led because I lead to serve my team. And I was surrounded by people that wanted to be served, you know, and it served me rather than serve we. And uh, yeah, just, so I just, I said, look, uh, did you know that in the last five years, 14 people 
that I have developed have been promoted. And they went, what? I was like, no. I said, you didn't know that. And I said, no one else is monitoring that. No one else is looking at that as a metric because all you're looking at is delivery. All you're looking at is how good are people at their jobs? Not how good are they at enabling others to be at their jobs? Because leaders create leaders, right? Yeah. And that was it. You know, that's my legacy. I, I, in five years, I helped 14 people go on and do more, more fulfilling work and, and hopefully go home happier and better for those who need them. Yeah, absolutely. It really is about making or allowing other people to yeah. be authentic, that they don't have to feel yeah. like they're there to be uh, yes, sir, no, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am allowing them yeah. to make some decisions and become leaders. Well, it's, it's a lot of time people spend at work, you know, and yeah. people are worried about, I've always tried to talk about a family mentality, a family ethos. And too many, um, too many people feel that that is dangerous and risky because it brings us too close to people. And I was like, well, when you come from an ideology of my job is to serve them and help them, feel like they matter, feel like they can come and contribute their time and their energy to something bigger than themselves so that they can make a difference and they go home better for them. I, I can't do that without intimately knowing them, their hopes, their dreams, their fears, you know, their strengths, their weaknesses, their values. I can't lead them the best they need to be led if I don't know that. Yeah. And then when you realize as a leader, you're the opportunity you have to make a difference far beyond the workplace, you take that. You know, many of my team were working mums, for example. You know, sometimes there can be an anxiety around being part-time and a mum that I've got to do this and I can't really pick up. Family first. Let me take away that anxiety. Let me, let me make you absolutely clear this is unconditional. You matter. Yeah. I want you to be able to do your best work. Go sort that out first. Yeah. Absolutely. So I've got, uh, I want to be uh, respectful of your time, Ryan. Um, and I have a final question. But uh, before I ask you that, is there, is there anything that you would like to talk about um, that I haven't already touched on? Hmm. Do you know what? I think the misconception of leading with love, it's all rosy, it's all nice. And here's what I know. The greatest teams, the greatest families, the greatest relationships, they're not without conflict. And I think love creates the space for that to be able to happen because it creates a, a, a sense of unconditional. I don't need you to perform. I don't need you to pretend. I don't need you to be inauthentic. I just need you to be real. I need you to be you. And I'm going to try and love myself enough that I can just listen without feeling like I need to justify, validate myself or any of those things. And in doing so, you're going to feel safe enough to say whatever you need to say is on your heart so that you feel like you are heard. And sometimes we're going to disagree and that's going to be okay because the best teams are not without conflict. They use it to grow stronger in their connections together. It's really difficult. Humans are messy, but the more that we can create time and space and sometimes just by slowing down and sometimes by speaking the unspoken and sometimes just by asking questions, seeking to understand before we just try and uh, make assumptions. So that's kind of just what I wanted to share. I guess that's just what on my heart at the moment is that leading with love is not easy. It's really, really difficult. Um, because human beings, whatever works one day might not work the next because we're emotional creatures. But a heart-centered leader will always strive every single day that they turn up to try and create that container where people can show up, feel safe, contribute to something bigger than themselves, do great work, and then go home better for those who need them. That was beautiful. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Uh, so my last question is, uh, what does the phrase own your space mean to you 
as a heart-centered leader? Two things. One is not to own somebody else's space because I think a great leader will shine a light on others. I think a great leader will enable people to step into their own space. And actually, you know, one thing I say about the Always Better Than Yesterday community is I don't do rules, but I do have one. And that is I need you to be yourself, nothing more, nothing less. And that is what a great leader can do to help others own their space. And then secondly, is, is, is back on the leader, is owning their space is just simply having that absolute ownership of knowing this is what I am here for. This is what I'm good at. This is what I stand for. And part of that space is the other side of the coin, which is, is all the stuff I'm rubbish at. And I'm going to own that space too. Because I do think our greatest strength can be our greatest weakness. Yes, that's absolutely accurate. Uh, that our, our greatest strengths can be our greatest weakness and to own all of it. The, the, the gift and the learning. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, um, Ryan Hartley, um, coming to us from the UK, I appreciate very much your time today. I'm honored to have you as a guest uh, to spend Thank your time you, spend your time chatting with me. My friend, it has been great spending time and just in time for the roosters I can hear. 